Hello and welcome to the Discovery Roundtable, the episode-by-episode episode discussion show for Star Trek Discovery. I'm your host, Drogan1701. With me, as always, is Green Dragoon. Hello. And uh, joining us as our guest for this evening is Captain P.F. Dennis. Good evening. And if you could introduce yourself a little bit. Oh, me? Uh, Captain P.F. Dennis. I've been uh, a Stowe player and Foundry author. Well, Stowe player since open beta and foundry author since Tribble, I guess, which is going back to about uh, late 2010 as it went live to Holodeck in March of 2011, I believe. And uh, yeah, been an avid author since of about 27, 28 missions. I say the uh, the three of us uh, were fortunate enough to be able to meet up at STLV uh, in 2016. That's correct. It's a lot of fun. Uh, so, so you were also there last year. Uh, I was. I, I'm curious, uh, you know, how much Discovery stuff was going on? I mean, I think there was a little <laughs> bit, but, you know, like, uh, how much was it, were people talking about it? Yes, a lot of people were interested in it, although I found, and maybe this is just my perception of it, but I went to the panel with the uh, the actors. There were only four. There was um, the doctor, Culver, and um, Cole, and... Um, the female Klingon. Laurel. Which were, yes, Laurel. And they were all good. And it was very interesting to hear them. There was also the uh, young Ensign who was killed in the pilot. <laughs> but uh, I liked him. Yeah, I did too. I thought, you know, by the way he showed up at STLV, I figured he'd be around a little while. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I found that the audience, I don't know, they were kind of cooled toward them in a way. I mean, many people were excited about it, but I'd say they weren't, I don't think they were as respected as the established actors and actresses that have come before. They were getting a lot of questions about why things were so different. And, uh, you know, these poor actors are like, they can't answer those questions. <laughs> why the Klingons look different. They were hired to <laughs> to play roles. They're not responsible, you know. It's down to the writing team. Yeah. yeah. And I felt bad for them. I felt bad because they were kind of put on the spot. But I enjoyed it. Matter of fact, if you know you have access to CBS All Access, you can see that panel. They have it as one oh, of really? their. Oh yes, yep. They I have had as, not realized that. Yep, they do. It's worth a watch, and you can see what I mean. You now, at some I, points, you. I assume yeah, if right. they're watching this, they've got access to CBS All Access. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, if they're watching. Well, you know, I mean, I mean, not <laughs> not the um, uh, the international audiences wouldn't. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Someone to watch it on Netflix. Mm-hmm. We should all be so lucky, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I have made my peace with uh, CBS All Access. In fact, I've I've gotten more than my money's worth out of it just watching NCIS uh, New Orleans. So <laughs> I'm I'm plenty happy with my decision to subscribe. And actually, the reason why Netflix was so great in the past is because they had all the Trek. But now it's on CBS All Access anyway. So I true. you know. Well, although okay. I like travels and I like a couple other shows, so I don't know. It's it's a tough one, tough <laughs> choice. <laughs> so, um, b- before we get on to uh, this week's episode, uh, I, I we ran into something funny yesterday. So we normally you know, try to a little bit relate all of this back to Star Trek Online, um, which doesn't have a lot of Discovery stuff going on right now, uh, although we hope it will soon. Um, but we can actually relate Discovery back to a, a, an entirely different Star Trek game, um, which we played yesterday for our other show, The Foundry Roundtable. Mm-hmm. Um, it's called Star Trek Hidden Evil from back in 1999. <laughs> <laughs> because the main character, get this, is a, a human raised by Vulcans who then joins Starfleet. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that, that sounded quite familiar. <laughs> so, yeah, we've come to the conclusion that no matter what you think, Everything in Discovery has been done before in Star Trek in some form. Oh, sure. But nobody, but nobody criticizes it for, for that. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Well, I, I, for some reason, and I can understand why a little bit, but people are detail-oriented. And Star Trek was always about detail. It was about detail in the way that they were consistent. You know, their history is always consistent. But you have to remember, too, that there was a difference between the 60s Trek, and then the 80s Trek, and then it was always reimagined. It was reimagined in the motion picture, never mind. Yeah. So oh, yeah. these changes have been normal 
throughout Trek, and I'm glad that that it's been updated. I mean, if it, if if they had you know cage looking costumes and weapons, people would get sick of that in two episodes. <laughs> I actually just went and watched the cage uh, right before the uh, the first episode of Discovery premiered, and yeah, I no, no that wouldn't work for me. Not not in 2017. No, and then you have people saying, "Oh, it's it's the Kelvin time because things are updated." No, it in looks fairness, a little I, like the movie. I just want to remind people that they literally changed Michael Dorn's makeup between seasons of TNG. His sure. forehead at the end of the show is completely different from his forehead at the beginning of the show. How about Odo? Yeah, yeah, Odo's makeup up changed a lot. Incredible. Um, it, it's funny because, I mean, there's there's behind-the-scenes things that some folks aren't aware of, and, and some of it even I wasn't aware of. Apparently, Gene Roddenberry wanted to design redesign the Klingons long before the motion picture, but he just, you know, they didn't have the budget to do anything like that. No. Well, that's the um, whole thing. Star Trek looked the way it did because they had no money. <laughs> and Star, Star Trek Discovery looks the way it does because they have nothing but money. <laughs> that's it. And that's wonderful. <laughs> it shows there's a commitment to it. And, and one of the other funny things is, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, everything sort of got rebooted and redesigned, reimagined uh, with the motion picture. If you look at some of the the f- sort of failed pilots and, and failed projects that were ultimately rolled into um, TMP and the first seasons of TNG, it was going to be rebooted and redesigned and reimagined a lot more crazy than things like tmp ended up being oh yeah uh what was it the um well well i mean even the dis- the s- design of discovery comes from the uh abandoned project something of the gods <laughs> i can't remember what it was exactly a lot of material out there and there are a lot of pitches out there. yeah you, you can only imagine i mean it's been what uh 12 years since the end of enterprise how many pitches have been made for some sort of new Star Trek show in that sure. interim time? Absolutely. I'd be very, cu- I'd be very curious to know that. Well, we know that uh, Takai wanted to do, uh, uh, Josh Takai wanted to do a Captain Sulu oh. show. I would watch that. Sure, so would I. I would watch that with John. <laughs> I would watch that with John Cho as Captain. That would be awesome. But yeah, anyway. I would, I would <laughs> think that they could get them to do guest appearances on this show if you know if they have a cause to. I mean, in the I was, future. I always kind of wondered about that, actually. Uh, if they decided to actually show Spock, uh, should yeah, they, they get, could get some... Kinto to do it? I, I think it'd be cool if they if Yeah, they I mean, that. even if it's, you know, we associate him with a Kelvin timeline, he's certainly not going to look different in the prime timeline. Yeah. That is the idea. So anyway, um, we're here to discuss episode seven, which is, what is it? Magic to make the sanest man go mad? Yes, yeah, a very long which title. Quite, quite the title, uh, which I'm sure I'm going to have to abbreviate uh, uh, when I'm uploading this. <laughs> That's okay. I'll put it back to the full title when you once you do. <laughs> I mean, compared to last week, you know, leafy. Yeah, it was just just one word. <laughs> um, so this was kind of a like a comedy interlude episode, um, almost. And I say almost because there was a, a good amount of characterization and character development going on. Um, which is kind of nice that they use the comedy episode to also do that. I found it very familiar feeling. After watching it, I I really did feel like it was a mud episode, you know? He's definitely at his most trickster level, um, mm-hmm. but but quite a bit more vicious, really, than in the uh, original series. Yes, yes. He was more of, you know, a scoundrel in the 60s. You know? <laughs> now he's a little bit more sadistic. A bit, a bit murderous. Yeah. Well, actually, not a bit. He's very murderous. <laughs> but then again, he got left behind in a Klingon prison by the captain. So, you know, naturally, I, I, I think most people would carry a grudge. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could also be looked at that this version of a mud is, uh, has not been beaten down as much as the one we see in TOS. Not to mention no, he's, young, still... he's younger and so more reckless. He's a very different place in his life. But obviously, same... a lot can happen to a guy in 10 years. I mean, at the I same time, the episode I, as a whole. Oh, go ahead. I was just say, I think at the same time, there was a few parts parts in it where it really did kind of feel like, uh, um, like the classic mud, especially when he was trying to weasel his way out of things. Yeah, it did. It it it's the way the episode was structured. You know, it was very similar to the way they did the original ones. And his reaction to seeing Stella, where he immediately just you <laughs> know tra- transitions transitions yeah. from being. Uh, you know, a total jerk to the Starfleet officers and suddenly Caesar, Stella, my darling. <laughs> <laughs> that that was very much, I thought. Yeah. 
I can't help but feel yeah, that yeah. Rain Wilson had a lot of fun with this part. Yes. And I think they're doing a great job. I mean, they're they're doing a great job casting, for sure. Um, I, I mean, Harry Mudd, uh, with Rain Wilson, I mean, I've, everybody's seen the office. Well, you know, not everybody's seen the office. I, I actually haven't, but I've seen him in other things, and he's right. been very... Oh, so anyway, Martin Green, I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah, she's great. as a Walking Dead fan, I never imagined her in a Star Trek show. Never would have thought of it. But now, after watching it, after watching the pilot, she fit right in. And her character is completely different and completely believable. I She's doing just, a fantastic job. I'd actually say this episode in particular has done a ton to really kind of um, blossom her character. I mean, in the past, she's been very yeah. stiff and closed off. Yeah, she's is, softening. But yeah, in this one, she can, we kind of got to see her a little more vulnerable emotionally. Mm-hmm. And that kind of, in, in those moments, we kind of got to see much more of her underneath. She's more at ease now. Uh, with the crew she's falling into that routine and uh she's she's also friends with uh you know basically two people who <laughs> are, are <laughs> but still i mean it's like the right two people to kind of open her up a little bit um yeah and, and as she keeps going i think i think she's gonna essentially prove herself to the rest of the crew that you know she's not her reputation and the rest of them are going to kind of come around to her as well I, I although i worry what could happen to her i mean the admiral has this thing you know so yeah i think people are pretty upset that she's in any position of you know legitimacy at all oh the, oh, the higher up the higher ups especially <laughs> yeah oh so, yeah you know and another oh, I... thing is i think ash tyler is a little too good to be true <laughs> you know i keep expecting something to happen yeah you, you know where where is the turn gonna be with this guy yeah. or i'll be honest or I think is it a... all or, is it all a red herring i mean if yeah, he's a klingon he spy he he might be a little bit too be too good to be true to be a Klingon spy. He's like the <laughs> best spy yeah, I mean, ever. He, he, he is like yeah. the, I mean, this is an Oscar worthy performance. If he is a spy, <laughs> you know, what, whatever, like a, whatever the Klingon Oscars are, you know, he's the, like two Klingon perfect. Academy film. <laughs> oh, yeah. But until it is the, revealed the, that he's a Klingon spy, I like him. <laughs> yeah. Hey, he stands up to torture. He comes out of it, you know, smelling like a rose, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, too good to be true. But <laughs> well, they did they did make comment at the fact that uh, uh, he seemed to remarkably be doing remarkably well for someone who went through six months of Klingon torture. Right, right. So yeah, they keep they keep poking. Morel's going to be coming back. Button. If you want to hear something really funny, okay. So on Twitter, uh, well, to give a little bit of background, um, the character of Vo is referenced in all of the credits as being played by somebody named Javid Iqbal, who no one has ever heard of, has has no credits other than this, um, has no like online presence whatsoever. And this has been part of the reason why everybody thinks, oh, Ash Tyler is Vogue. <laughs> um, because it's like, okay, they're just doing that so they fake us out and all that. Um, so on Twitter has appeared an account for Javid Iqbal, who has been... Um, photoshopping folks head over various pictures and saying look i am a real person check this out <laughs> <laughs> you know and, and i don't i don't that. know if, <laughs> i don't know if it's anyone on the actual you know affiliated with the actual production or if it's no, just some it's probably who, just some fan who i mean that I, made a joke account either way it's hilarious <laughs> <laughs> you know i didn't um, think it, it's it, actually it's, ash it, tyler yeah that that is the the going theory hmm. um hmm. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, the meat of this episode is uh, that Mud has created a time loop um, using something that with, with some tenuous uh, techno babble is then referred to as a time crystal. <laughs> that yeah. that explanation was like a little, mm, yeah, okay, whatever, I'll just go with it. Yeah, but it was some fourth dimensional species who perfected it. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. It's not like every Star Trek show ever hasn't made science know. out of their bodies. Oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I I saw somebody the other day criticize Discovery for its quote pseudoscience, and like thinking, did did you think everything you were seeing in in all of the other seven hundred episodes was completely real plausible science? <laughs> did you really think that? Well, then they point to look the the communicator turned into a flip phone, and the pad is an iPad, and so. <laughs> Maybe someday there'll be a. We'll have time crystals. Someday. Time crystal. Man, if they just bounced a particle beam off the main deflector dish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, it's not working. 
reverse the polarity. Yeah. Um, so I, I, it's funny because time loops at this point seem like a cliche that like every science fiction net show does and sometimes non-science fiction shows too. Um, but the funny thing is, is that most of the ones I've seen actually turn out to be really good episodes. Yeah. yeah um, the cause and effect. That's the classic. Um, yeah. Voyager has a not so classic one, Coda, <laughs> which mm-hmm. Janeway just keeps dying over and over again yeah. or something like that. It's been a long time since I've seen that one. I, I have that, not watched that. Was well, that that really weird one where she's like on death's door? Yeah. And she's talking to her father, only it's actually oh, yeah. some alien. Oh, yeah. That yeah. was a bizarre episode. It's, and Len it's Carrier. A, it was early, Voyager. Really great. Uh, early Voyager was pretty weird sometimes. I did like the shattered one where different sections of the ship. That was a good episode. Were in different time that periods. Was, that was good. Yeah. But, you know, um, the, the time loop for Star Trek, I mean, they, I'm sure they said, you know, there's always a time loop in Star Trek. But because they were doing it with mud, I guess they figured it could be a little tongue in cheek and nobody would really pick it yeah, apart. And they, as some other shows fail to do, they do kind of put their own little take on it because it's usually. OK, so the ways we've seen time loops used before, it's either uh, it's usually uh, Groundhog Day rehash of Groundhog Day where it's comedic effect and you see all the um, the effects on the, on your character basically reliving the same day and although shenanigans mm-hmm. that happen. Um, this one was a little different because uh, for one, the person who was experiencing the loop is not any of our main characters. I mean, our our story focuses on, uh, uh, on Burnham. Burnham and uh, Tyler. Um, but with the person all... who is actually reliving, you know, knows that they're reliving the same 30 minutes is uh, in addition to mud, of course, is Lieutenant Stamets because, you know, thankfully uh, when you're hopped up on uh, cosmic mushrooms, apparently (laughs) that um, places you outside of normal time. Yeah. Well, it's that, uh, you know, the uh, DNA, which I got to say from the tardigrade. Yeah. I I mean, he, he is just playing this so hilariously this complete change in his personality. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I like, I like that people notice, I mean, Burnham in her, in her log, she makes a note of that, <laughs> that, that this is bringing out new parts of his personality. Um, so I'm glad, I'm glad that people noticed that. Uh, <laughs> it, it was great when he, um, Oh, it was like uh, the very first loop when he, uh, runs into Burnham and Tyler in the hallway and, <laughs> yeah. and you know, start, starts off with, wow, you're tall. Yeah. Gives her a big hug. Yeah. So, so what's the deal with you two anyway? <laughs> yeah, See, so again, and, with the cast, you know, they, yeah. they hire good people. He, he pulls it off wonderfully. I, lo- I love Burnham's awkwardness throughout like the whole episode, which is just, I, I feel like part of the mandate for this show was to let's it's like let's do star trek but with like real people yeah yeah i find that in the writing it's it's you know there are plenty of things in the writing that are a little different from normal star trek writing some of the expressions i mean they dropped a couple of f-bombs in the show a couple of weeks ago yeah which i was amazed at but uh you know in, in quick passing it didn't even really mean anything it's a joke but you know some of the things they say like uh I noticed last week Tyler said, you know, I've been close to death. I mean, I was right up close to it. And you don't hear things like that. I was right up against it. Lines like that, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit more natural than the dialogue we've heard. Before. Yeah, I mean, there, especially T, the TNG era was kind of had this very uh, specific style of speaking. Yeah, it was stiffer and more professional. Yeah, it enlightened. <laughs> Yeah, which is more correct. I mean, there weren't any colloquialisms. I guess we're closer to our time, our present day, not by much, you know, from TOS, but I don't know. I feel like like it flows pretty well with um, from Enterprise. So I think they had a little bit of the same mandate on Enterprise. Yeah, Uh, they tried. They should be a little bit closer to um, present day people. Yeah, I mean, they dumped the baseball hats really quick, but, you know, they they started (laughs) out. With yeah, they you know they tried to tie it in, try to get us a little. Okay, closed. we we need we need some discovery baseball hats. Well, you know we've already had the disco shirt. Yeah, uh, we need we need the baseball cap. <laughs> <laughs> Coming soon to a CBS um, store near you. Yeah. Exactly. I just want to yes. see helmets. Mr. Van yeah. Sitters, are you listening? I'm sorry, helmets on Star Trek were always a crash and burn, as far as I'm concerned. Speaking of helmets, uh, we we had um, okay. So when Harry Mud pops out of the space whale. 
which is which is a pretty good infiltration <laughs> trick. Uh, yeah. You see the helmet he's wearing. Apparently, it is supposed to be an Andorian style helmet. Yeah, that's pretty. Scott awesome. antenna and everything. Yep. Um, this is something that they they had said on After Trek, um, which, which I did, I have not been watching, but you tend to hear everything that was said on there anyway if you're on Twitter. So, <laughs> um, it, it was kind of goofy, but they I think they lessened that goofiness a little bit with how that scene is shot when he pops out of there because he immediately starts shooting and killing people. And there's this great shot of Burnham uh, taking cover behind the console and the camera sort of follows her. And I'm thinking to myself, it's like, this is never, this is a shot that none of the other shows would do. It's just this quick, you know, it's like something you would see on arrow. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Rather than Star Trek. Yeah. That's a sign of the times maybe. Mm -hmm. But I mean, cinematography in general is a, uh, art that's always evolving oh yeah and it is an art just like anything else you know you you go back um oh to to you know the very early 2000s and nobody was doing shaky cam in action movies or (laughs) sci-fi movies or anything like that so you can blame firefly for that (laughs) (laughs) as awesome as firefly is it started that trend at least i i think it did yeah you've just seen the all the uh, special features for the first star trek you know 2009 that's all J.J. did was pound on the camera to make it shake. <laughs> it was funny because I, I remember, you know, hearing about when, when that technique first started being used a lot in like science fiction. Um, cameramen had a really hard time with it because they were trained to be very good and very steady. Right. It's like, right. It's like they couldn't make a mistake. <laughs> 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 and so, you know, directors would like, you know, hit the camera basically and, and, and actually, you know, uh, give give black eyes to their cameramen. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because of that. But it's all for the art, man. It's you all know, for the yeah. art. Well, I've been pretty impressed with the visuals in the show, and you know, I, oh. I hate to sound like a complete fanboy, but I, I haven't had much negative to say about the show so far. <laughs> <laughs> and um, some people have. You know, I, I've had maybe one or two little things that haven't worked for me in just about every episode, but, but really, that's it for me. And I think that's a pretty good place to be in for a first season. Yeah, yeah. And the, the matter of fact, you know, think about the first seasons of our other. Beloved shows. Yeah. yeah. Try TNG not to. And, and <laughs> DS9, too. There were some very rough patches in there. Yeah. DS9, very... early DS9 was just kind of slow. Oh, yeah. It, was, it wasn't until they finally introduced the and, and they had some Dominion and Jemadar. That... Too. Yeah. So, I, one of, uh, let's see, was it last week, I think, after we were on episode six? I was like, you know, thinking about. Um, where we were in the other shows at this point. So, so with episode seven, so like in Deep Space Nine, it was Qless, where Q shows up with Vash. Yeah. Which is not really a great episode, except for one scene where Cisco punches Q. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the one everybody which, makes which, a meme out of. Which, yeah. which is like a, a metaphor for the show when he says, I am not Picard, which is right. the show is not TNG. Well, can we say that though? I mean, it was, was that episode seven of DS9? It was. Because now we have to think that episode seven of Discovery is like maybe further in. We're almost halfway through the season. This is true. So if you want to look at like, you know, halfway ish through the season of uh, Deep Space Nine, you've got, you know, the Negus. You got Move yeah. Along Home, which is a terrible episode. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Super annoying episode. Yeah. Uh, Vortex. I'm not sure if I even remember that one. That's. Wait, um, does anybody remember how the- stiff the characters were back then? <laughs> compared to how they Extreme. ended Extreme. Vortex is Odo and um, the guy with the shape-shifting key uh, and his daughter was locked in the you know in the nebula on that planet it's clearly not a memorable episode for me <laughs> uh, um, I mean yeah it was it was one of those slow ones but if you if you look at like mid-season TNG you have um, uh, data lore mm-hmm. which is which isn't a bad episode Um one one zero zero one zero zero one, which is a decent episode. So you have some good ones in in TNG series. I mean, there's there's not, it's not all bad. No, uh, I don't and, know if there's and, anything. And I think, but I think Discovery is is really having a very strong first season comparatively. Yeah, yeah. I, like I will say, say I will say this though. Um, I'm kind of ready to get back to the overarching storyline. Yeah, what's going on with the Klingons right now? Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm kind of, you know, we've had our fun for a couple episodes here. Uh, yeah. and doing different things, going off of some tangents. Let's bring it back around. Yeah, we're going to have uh, the Admiral being, you know, in captivity mm-hmm. in the next episode. 
we're gonna, we're gonna have uh, we're gonna see some we're gonna get back to some Klingon stuff. We're actually gonna have a, a an episode focused on Saru, or at least that's what it seems like from the promo. Yes, yeah. which I, I've been kind of looking forward to that because he, he's been a little bit of a non-entity lately. He, do, he doesn't do much. No, and according to Anthony Rapp, it's his Emmy performance. <laughs> so we'll see. I believe it. Um, so let's see. Um, let me let me ask you guys this: what What is your favorite time loop episode? I was talking about this on Twitter earlier earlier today. You know, uh, of all of the ones you've seen, what is your favorite time loop episode? Time loop. Yes. Okay. Well, I like this one, like cause and effect. Yeah, I would have to say that. I would have to say cause and effect. There was no real comedic tint to that one. It was more an in investigation. Yeah, which is a how lot they of figured what out. Was. So it was it was a mystery. Yeah. How they T- figured T- out how to get out mystery shows. the incidences of the number three and all that. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I will the say are one of the best uh, TNG episodes. One of the things I have to really compliment uh, Cause and Effect on is the fact that we literally see the same set of scenes like five times over, and it doesn't get boring yeah, from different angles. <laughs> yeah, they were all shot in different perspectives. Yeah, but it, it it's kind of weird because it becomes this sort of watching for the differences you're like rewatching the same scene but you're watching to see how this one is just a little bit different than the last time they did it and so they 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 use different angles different camera angles and follow different characters throughout each yeah. loop um and you could kind of start to pick up on all of that uh, right. after the first couple of times and they really didn't have any hint they didn't have a stamets to clue them in they had to kind of figure it out yeah no nobody right. knew uh that they were reliving that uh, however long um, oh, it seemed like deja vu at the beginning yeah and they, they had to figure it out each time um the the one that i like most of all out of all the various time loop episodes is uh white tulip from fringe um which is arguably the show's best episode uh, overall <laughs> and it it's one of those where it it goes for the emotional notes um you know it's something that makes you a little bit teary-eyed at the end um you know, rather than the mystery like cause and effect, or rather than the comedy like this episode, right. or uh, Windows of Opportunity from uh, Stargate SG One. Yeah, Windows of Opportunity was definitely a full-on comic. Oh yeah. Uh, I don't know if and this even one was it, even it got a little so much yeah. comic. Um, I mean, if anything, it certainly... it's probably more of a character exploration. Yeah, it had elements. Yeah, that is true. Was, yeah, Mud Mud has certainly just... has his comedic side, and Stamets you know, a little bit, just because he's so up there. Right now. <laughs> but Mud is and, reveling in how many times he got to kill Lorca. I, I wasn't yeah. sure whether to laugh or be sort of horrified at that scene. <laughs> right. Maybe a little of both. Yeah, I was wondering what that weapon was. You got you got some interesting weapons on this one, and you got and, and and throughout this whole show, actually. I mean, you got the the Klingon disruptors that are like you know one shot and just poof, you're gone. Yeah. Uh, and it, it looked like he used one of those at least. Um, yeah, I was th- thinking maybe it was an early version of the Veron T. Oh, there's an idea. <laughs> you know, uh, they they do like to do callbacks or call forwards because he really, you know, it was really gruesome the way he was vaporized by it. It was just slowly actually, disintegrated. Um, Trek Core over on Twitter was posting some various uh, shots from previous treks of people being vaporized, and there were a couple of effects that were almost just like that, where you sort of see the skeleton and then that disintegrates too. Right. So, like you said at the beginning of the show, Green Dragoon, um, there's nothing that Star Trek hasn't done before. <laughs> so it's like you can't criticize it for being untrek because it's been done before. <laughs> and they do it again because we must have liked it the first time. <laughs> See, well, that's exactly. tried and true. Well, I mean, creativity in general is often uh, reimaginings of things done previously. I mean, most... sure. Most things that you see have been done in some form before, but it's a new take on something. Well, what is it? You know, everything can be related back to a Shakespeare play. <laughs> I wonder which one this is. <laughs> Actually, I, I was trying to I was trying to think earlier today about you know what what is the first instance of a time loop story, um, and, and you know obviously I only have uh, limited um, research capabilities, but I, I saw there was at least you know one movie from back like 1945 that had one, so. <laughs> <laughs> Groundhog Day is not the originator no. <laughs> of this phenomenon in in fiction. Um, in, in fact, cause and effect came out the year before Groundhog. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I wasn't sure about that, so I had to look that up. So one of, one of the other things is, you know, I, I kind of like to keep track of my Twitter timeline and see what people are talking about most of all from each episode. And one of the things that has come up a lot is the party 
um, that is going on aboard the Discovery, uh, which which seems to be mainly you know junior officers. Um, it's it's one of those things that's fairly different from what we've seen before. Although um, Jadzia's bachelorette party got pretty <laughs> raucous. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it struck me as something that was you know an, another bit in that mandate of let's show some real people and realistic right. people and realistic things that they would do like get drunk, like hook up, you know, at parties, especially, you know, young people. Cause these are people who are like, a lot of them are going to be fresh out of the Academy, you know, yeah. young 20 something officers. <laughs> well, and apparently officers are, you know, not supposed to fraternize according to Burnham anyway. Uh, yeah. Well, she said that specifically about um, being in the uh, XO position. Because right. everybody's under you. So oh, if yeah. you're a Which senior is... officer, like Saru wouldn't show up there. No. But I mean, this is something that they're... I don't think Saru would show up regardless. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, I'd be afraid. He would be. Well, but one of the things that's, um, that I, was th- I thought was kind of funny is, you know, if this was TNG, it would have been like a, you know, a violin recital. <laughs> or a poetry yeah. reading or something like that, you know. Right. Uh, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be a full-on party. And, you know, I, I'd... I'm not one for parties anyway, but I think I'd rather go to, uh, you know, the disco party than, uh, you know, something like a violin recital. Uh, But there are obviously people who like violin recital. Um, Sure, but you can't have that constantly. No. I mean, diversity is the key in the future, isn't it? It I think think part of it was that um, TNG wanted, because it was set so far in the future, they wanted to separate it from modern times by not doing anything modern times. And so it yeah, ended up like, being like classical music and stuff. <laughs> the only it, was people, all, it was all highbrow. It was opera and classical right, music. Right, right. Look what happened when they played a little contemporary music. Picard went nuts. Poor Jono. He just wanted to listen to some rock. You know, <laughs> you know I mean, if I, down. if I was the captain, uh, you know, people would be like, oh, God, he's playing that, you know, 200 year old heavy metal again on the bridge. <laughs> Why won't he stop? I hate classical music. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I'll tell you one, one little detail I like though, is that you could see, um, they, they showed an exterior shot and you could see the lights flashing Yeah, from the inside. Yeah. That was a really cool, uh, bit on the front of the ship there. Uh, and, and, now, and it gave us a, a nice location for where the mess hall is. You notice that like they're doing a lot of spinning on discovery, I like the saucer spins. And did you notice that when Sarek was getting on the Vulcan ship, it spun into position? Mm. Like everything's turning around on Discovery. <laughs> everything's cool with spinning. Yeah, they like spinning things. <laughs> um, you know, pro- probably the the best thing about the party though is you know what Burnham's reaction to it all is, wh- which is that sort of social anxiety kind of thing, uh, which a lot of fans are going to relate to. Sure, I don't know. I well, I see that there is some natural apprehension. But in her past, I think her whole youth was spent in pursuit of one goal. You not know, to mention, and she was learning basically. You know. Right. Not, not to mention, no and, uh, you kind of see, you kind of, she kind of talks about this in the beginning. That yeah, I mean, she's got a criminal past. I mean, and I think a part of her is just waiting for the shoe to drop for someone to realize, nope, back to prison with you. And so <laughs> yeah. she doesn't want to form any attachments because it's just going to get ripped away once. Uh, the consequences of her previous actions catch up with her. Right. But luckily she has, uh, like the perfect roommate to get her out of that <laughs> notion. <laughs> um, basically the person who won't let her be antisocial. <laughs> right. I mean, um, she couldn't be more opposite. Yeah. Bubbly is. Can I just, which is funny because I had Barclay. sort of, a <laughs> uh, there, I see some similarities with that character. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Our our, uh, our fellow Foundry author XR three seven seven will be happy to hear that. Uh, although obviously she predates Amanda Barkley by some hundred years or whatever. Well. Uh, so <laughs> another <laughs> another fellow Foundry author uh, just tweeted me, um, Horient, who says uh, is got a picture of the um, Stella's ship at the end, or her father's mm-hmm. ship probably, uh, which you get just a very brief glimpse of as it undocks from Discovery. Um, and says, uh, this, so this could be the, uh, 2018 summer event ship for Stowe. Cause it's kind of a luxury liner ish, a little bit. Look, kind of mm. I don't know. I thought it looked kind of too Yeah. Like, ship. yeah I, like I, I, two I huge like cells underneath central hull. It was, you know, 
I didn't think it was particularly cool looking. <laughs> you know, <which> is <laughs> I don't think that was what they were going for. No. Well, I mean, they, they clearly didn't linger on it. And if I had yeah. one criticism of Discovery so far and its visual style, is it they don't linger on the ships enough. Because it's like, oh, you know, this is Star Trek. I want to see the starships more. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you just get glimpses and, and very actiony shots of like the fleet in the battle at the very beginning of the first couple episodes. Right. Um, you only, you never get the whole Klingon vessel when they were, when um, Captain Lorca was captured. They never showed the whole vessel in the shot. It was always, you know, reaching out a shot. Now, the, in their defense, I'll say one thing is that we're getting half the episode. So maybe they'd rather spend a little bit more time on the characters and story. And it's probably less expensive not to <laughs> to show too much either. But unless they don't have time to waste, you're right, you're absolutely right about that. Um, that that was my criticism of the uh, X Files revival is I, I felt Ooh. like they wasted what little time they had <laughs> on filler episodes. Which yeah, I mean, I, w- I would say Discovery is not doing. I really wish it was a regular season, but I'm just well, happy we're getting new Trek at all at this. Yes, ab- absolutely. And, and, you know, we, we know it'll be around for season two, and I think the, the speculation is probably season three. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, maybe we'll get an increased episode count next year. That would be nice. Get it, get it back up into the 20s. I'd be Although, curious to know what the response is so far, like what their ratings are and mm-hmm. if, they, if it's met projections. I'll be honest. I think the 20-plus uh, episode model is in its of itself going away, and you're seeing less and less. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the only shows that that are still doing twenty plus episodes are like the procedurals, like you know NCIS or um, I don't know, or any of the CSIs still on, oh, no. or is that gone? I, <laughs> I don't know. I'm the wrong know. person I to comment watch on. Those. I don't watch any, hardly any TV. I watch The Walking Dead and Discovery. What, Walking Dead still has a pretty hefty episode. Count, yes, it, it does. Yep. But I mean, I've even seen some like like twenty four plus. Uh, Shows actually like subdivide their uh, seasons in half, so they'll oh, their yeah. first half will have its own plot, and then the second half will have a different plot. Or uh, a- Agents of Shield actually divided into three plot lines in this past season. So I um, think it's I, I'm I'm not sure I 100 percent like that, but uh, that's just me. I think um, it's an attempt. Interestingly to, enough, it allows them to tell more tighter stories because you do start to really yeah. get those filler episodes when you have that many mm-hmm. episodes. You do, um, and, and that was I think something that didn't serve. Deep Space Nine very well in its last two seasons. I, I felt like there were too many filler episodes between mm. the war episodes. Right. Um, I, I think, and I, I even tried to do this one time, is, you know, pare it down into about 13 episodes per season and, and make it, you know, and, and, I, and I felt like you could do that. There was enough filler episodes that you could cut it down that much. The, pr- the trouble with that is that in these filler episodes, they might, might drop one or two facts that you'd need going yeah, forward you'd have to put that stuff in the other episodes for sure yeah and and it's not to say those were bad episodes either no it's very, just that like they didn't seem to belong in the course you know we're thinking in terms of serial now whereas yeah, they, they were like you no know, they said yeah the last 10 episodes of ds9 were serialized but before that it was episodic because that's how things were in the 90s yeah that's you know just that was the nature of television uh which it just isn't today but it is interesting that, you know we're talking about episode counts um and I always tend to forget this, but uh, Voyager, because it was actually a, it started sort of like mid-season, uh, as far as, you know, the TV at the time went, uh, it only had 16 episodes in its first season. Yeah, and that uh, kicked off a network, just like Discovery. It did. <laughs> kicked off That's a doomed true. network. <laughs> uh, you know, doomed many years later. <laughs> yeah. Although I, you could still say it's sort of going as the CW, I guess. Maybe a little. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, there, there's, CW's, there's a lot of history. CW is making its uh, making its way on DC. Yeah. Yeah. What I love about the CW is it, it really likes to stick with its shows. It doesn't like to cancel mm-hmm. things. We will, we will hope that CBS uh, goes the same way. Although, as you were pointing out um, in our uh, Discord chat the other day, Paul, um, they will have to come up with some stuff to fill the gaps uh, and keep people subscribed between seasons of Discovery. Sure, there's going to have to be original all-access programming. I mean, I it wouldn't make I any saw sense. Something about that they just announced some new original show that they're putting on there. 
I didn't see that. Yeah, I just saw it today, and it was not interesting enough for me to remember what the name was. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's not a good sign. That doesn't bode well. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> NCIS doesn't appear to appeal to me either, so well. what I like may not necessarily represent the popular views. <laughs> like I said, I'm the wrong person to ask about it. I, I watch three shows, you know. I, I watch too many. <laughs> I'm actually falling behind. Um, you know, well, I'm I, waiting. I think Traveler's second season hits our Netflix in December. I think it's already in Canada. <laughs> well, you know, I, as people were, you know, are, are always not happy with American TV because of the delays in when it becomes available internationally. Well, we're feeling your pain with Travelers <laughs> because it's it's airing right now in Canada, but it's not going to you know be available for us until December. So. I was shocked to see the Stranger Things at season two come out. I thought that that show's been on longer than that. No, no just the one just season. season two. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I haven't seen it, so I don't know. But uh, it's quite good. I I, I like it. Well, maybe I'll give that a shot. <laughs> <laughs> I like Any, to describe it as remembers the eighties. Yeah, I'd like to describe it if, as if ET the Extraterrestrial and X Files merged. <laughs> it's very very Spielbergian. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that's a compliment. I, I would say so. All right. Well, let's see. Final thoughts on this episode. I liked well, it. It kind of served as a nice, uh, more personal episode after kind of the, some of the more darker tone. The last, and I think it kind of serves as a necessary, more lighthearted episode because it sounds like next week will be more serious. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed it a lot. I thought it was reminiscent of the originals. I think it fits in well with the traditional mud episodes. I think it was structured very similarly. I, I think they did a really good job with it. I was happy with it. I, I do as well. Um, even if I said I'm ready to get back to the uh, <laughs> the, the more serious stuff, um, I think there's always a place for a little, a, something that's a little bit more. Yeah. yeah, I want to see the away team next week. I want to see them go down on a planet. That'll be interesting. <laughs> you know, Explore some strange new worlds. So one one final question before we uh, end this for the evening. Um, one one of the things that uh, a Twitter friend of mine has been doing is pulling on everybody's favorite episode and you know dropping the least favorite ones each week to make sh- room for the next episode. So w- what is your favorite episode of the seven that we've had so far? Ooh. While you're thinking, I, I'll tell you mine, which is the third episode. Context is for kings. Um, I thought it moved along at a great pace and it had um, just that that great middle section um where they're on board the derelict uh spaceship yeah. which the glen um yeah. and the shushing klingon which just makes everything better <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna have to agree with you because i was just thinking which was the one where they first met the tardigrade yeah and that, that and was that's that one. the same episode yeah and, and it just had that brilliant um final scene with Lorca explaining everything to to Burnham and just the you know ending with the delivery of the line of context is for kings and I just I just love that. I don't know I'd have yeah. to say this one my favorite. <laughs> you had Rain Wilson doing a really good mud and really throwing himself into the part. You finally have like more of Burnham, like a relatable person. And uh you got um Stamets on Spores. <laughs> What's not like, like that? Stan, Stamets on Spores is just hilarious at, yeah. at, every, at every turn. Um, uh, is it bad that well, I don't well, want to go back to normal? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think it's also a little bit ominous, his behavior. Like, you know, there's going to be some bad things that come with this. Later oh, on. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So my running sure. theory is that the way Stamets is behaving is the natural disposition of the tardigrade, if the tardigrade could talk. <laughs> Stoner tardigrades. Yeah, it's funny, just like Tardigrade said this. Uh, <laughs> oh, aren't you guys all just swell? Yeah, <laughs> laid back, affectionate, and, you know, we tortured it. We just <laughs> used it up until it collapsed. Yeah. Make Duck and Idaho no, no end of happy if the Tardigrade turns out to be a big, loving teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> tardigrade bridge officers, come on, Stowe, make it happen. Oh, yeah. I'd love to see more creatures in Stowe. Uh, that would be a great thing to have, but obviously there there's just you know an ever increasing amount of of awesome discovery content that could be ported into Stowe. So yes, yes. we'll have to take it as we get it. All right, gentlemen. Well, thank you for uh, joining us. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be here as always. And until next time, enjoy the final frontier. <laughs>